A lot of people buy into the philosophy of retirement because they, they live a life that's about trading time for money, exhausting themselves by working tirelessly and setting money aside and they're finally like, when do I finally get to enjoy life? So Brad says, what do you see as the best opportunity on the horizon for your clients? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a couple different aspects of this. Number one, when we enter economies like this that has a storm of a pandemic, uh, rising interest rates, quantitative easing where we've added 40% money to the money supply, a run up on residential real estate as people were like, you know, trying to take advantage of low interest rates. I think the biggest opportunity is people are going to be in a distressed situation. People right now are over leveraged and over committed and underpaid in a lot of ways. And as inflation creeps in and starts to make life a little bit more complicated, the biggest opportunity is to help those people that are struggling. I know people that went in and found people that were not able to really handle their real estate because of the pandemic, bought it out rather than have it go foreclosed to a bank or through some short sell. So that person ended up making a couple hundred thousand dollars rather than nothing. And then the person that bought who had a much better financial situation was able to, to hold on and now they're capitalizing where they've had massive appreciation. So if you have liquidity and capital, you can actually buy businesses because businesses are going to come available or there's going to be massive opportunity in real estate. Tim knows a lot about that, teaches a lot about that. So you should look him up if you're not familiar with him and his group, because I've met a lot of people in that group that are very versed in different aspects of that game. But I think that it's these types of times where the most wealth happens. So let me, let me go back to like what, what has gone on and, and Trisha, hopefully you can find out who's not on mute and try to mute them uh, the best you can. Uh, everyone, if you can make sure you're on mute um, so we don't have background noise, that would be awesome. Um, but if we go back, clear back to the Great Depression, that is obviously a time that was an incredible struggle for so many people. But there was this Professor Gregory at the University of Washington and he did studies on it and he found a third of the people that during the time of the Great Depression were what we saw. Those pictures of they looked thin, they looked like they had been out in the dirt, maybe even homeless, because it, back in those days, a bank could come and call a note due at any time. And if you didn't have money to pay off the mortgage, you could lose your home. Those rules don't exist today, but that created a, a big problem and we had a lot of turmoil during that time. The second thing though, is a third of people during that time actually maintained. It was a struggle, they had to work harder, but they maintained. But there's never been a time in history in the United States where more people were made millionaires, and especially if we're adjusting for inflation where it really meant being a millionaire back then, because there was a massive amount of opportunity through disruption. Disruption means when there's more chaos, there's more people looking for leadership. There's more people needing help to either be bailed out, and we don't want the government to do that because that comes at the expense of inflation and a whole lot of inefficiency. But if you as an individual can go in there and say, with this distress, a lot of businesses are going to change hands. A lot of those businesses are going to go out of business and just leave behind a customer database so you can pick it up for pennies on the dollar. Other people are going to hold on until they can't make payments anymore. And all of a sudden, what's going to happen to that property? And if you have knowledge around how to improve that property, rent that property out, fix and flip that property. Okay. So a third of the people actually got ahead in the Great Depression. In the Great Depression. I'm not saying that we're headed for that level of disruption and turmoil. Although we are watching some chaos happen with supply chain issues. We're watching, you know, an, um, an unprecedented amount of spending over the last 10 years from government spending. So we're over $30 trillion in debt. This kind of stuff creates opportunity for individuals that can really get clear about their investor DNA. What is it that you value? Like, what is it that you're paying attention to and matters to you? I know people that are in real estate because it matters to them to provide housing because they struggled to provide housing for themselves at one time, or they had a, a family member going to a nursing home and they want a better system, or there's people that just, you know, that's what they like. You've got to figure out what you value. Then second, where do you have competencies? Where can you learn more? quickly? Where can you accelerate your value because it's something that interests you? And then finally, what drives you that you're more passionate about? When you look at your values, your competencies and drivers, that defines who you are as an investor and you become a better investor knowing your investor DNA because risk isn't in the investment. It's in you, the investor. So how do you increase your financial IQ in a focused way? Diversification is a strategy that's only really effective for having a way to preserve wealth. 
Otherwise, it's a distraction and diversification when we're trying to gain wealth and we get involved in things we know nothing about, or we don't understand the outcome of that income, or we neglect cash flow, or we simply set it and forget it and wait for 30 years with a retirement plan hoping it's going to pay off. The rules here are focus on cash flow and look for ways to make money on the buy. Money on the buy means you make money from day one because of that distress and you take that load off someone who can't handle it because it's not part of their investor DNA or because they don't have the cash management or the know-how. There is massive opportunity coming. I know I'm interrupting, but it's because if you go to garrettgunderson.com forward slash quiz, you can figure out your money persona. When you know your money persona, you'll be able to make better choices when it comes to your finances, understand where you've made mistakes and missteps and what was the psychology behind that, and really improve how you view money and how you work with other people with different money personas. So Garrett Gunderson, forward slash quiz, no charge, discover your results, and go ahead and comment. Let us know what it was. The second question is, if you had a limited network and wanted to recruit financial backers for a two-year-old hard money business, what would your process be? Well, Brad, I would just join Legacy. They have people talk all the time about that specific thing um, on, on how to you know, garner investors and things like that, and they've had amazing panels on that. Are there more comedy shows in the future? Yeah, uh, on our website, we've now updated that as of today. We've got basically two a month coming out for the next several months. You'll hear from us more in the future with all those details. Uh, Monica says, please offer your thoughts regarding pre-retirement in two years, financial planning strategy in today's market. All right. So first off, let's talk about retirement for a minute. Like a lot of people buy into the philosophy of retirement because they, they live a life that's about trading time for money, exhausting themselves by working tirelessly and setting money aside. And they're finally like, when do I finally get to enjoy life? What would happen if you could enjoy life along the way and have your financial freedom be an extension of a life well lived? If quality of life was at the forefront because you invested in yourself and your skill sets and that quality of life so that you had a different level of energy than someone like my dad who worked as a coal miner, that is ridiculous ridiculous work that you want to retire from. So instead of thinking about retirement, I want to reframe this into financial independence. And when I talk about financial independence, it's different than financial freedom. Financial freedom is a state of mind where money is no longer the primary reason or excuse for doing or not doing something. I'll repeat that. Financial freedom is a state of mind where money is not your primary reason or excuse for doing or not doing something. It's a consideration, just not the consideration. When you're financially free, you think value first, cost and economics second, and price third. Let me make a distinction. Price is what we pay, cost is our economic impact. I have accounting team that I pay more than the average accounting team that the world's out there paying, but they save me so far more than what I pay if I get a cheap accountant. So that's higher price, lower cost because of the net impact. And Tim, before we started this, he was talking about having amazing employees means maybe you pay more for that employee, but they produce so much more because IBM did a study that an A teamer is 5,200% more productive than a B teamer. So yes, higher price, but higher output on the net. So price, cost, value. People are financially free, consider value first, economic cost second, and price third. People not financially free focus on price and price alone and miss out on investments and opportunity and the right type of lifestyle. So financial independence, on the other hand, is kind of the overarching goal, which will help you regardless of where your phase is, retirement, pre-retirement, or you know, far pre-retirement. Financial independence is when you have assets that produce cash flow to cover your basic expenses. Those assets might be one of two types of things. Assets that are assets that cash flow because it might be things like real estate, or it might be things like stocks or bonds or tax liens or just your, your investment portfolios. But the second one are businesses, businesses that don't require your daily involvement. So there are parts of anyone's business that requires their daily involvement. Right now I'm here speaking, so this isn't a, you know, a recurring revenue. This isn't a passive cash flow. So when you have enough recurring revenue that comes from cash flow of assets to cover your basic expenses, you're financially independent. Now, financial independence gives you more room to choose what you want to do on a daily basis, including be able to swing for the fences in anything you do, knowing your financial life is in order and the basics are handled. So for example, I'm married to a money persona of a planner slash conservative. 
My wife always wants to know, do we have enough money in the bank? Do we have enough savings and stability? What's our plan for the future? And as soon as we were financially independent, where we have enough cash flow coming in that if I take a month off, which I'm going to be off for the next three weeks, well, she knows that all the bills are covered even if I don't go into work. That's financial independence, which means she's one of the biggest cheerleaders of the work I do when I say, hey, I'm 40, I should start doing comedy even though I've been in finance for a quarter of a century. She's like, cool. Now, if I said that 20 years ago, she'd be like, you're definitely not as funny as you think you are. We are not gonna make a living off that because I know people, fun she says hurtful things like her friend's funnier than me. I'm like, babe, do you even know where my heart is and what I do for a living? But you see the difference of financial independence is so, Here's the formula, regardless of where you're at, to enhance and improve your financial independence and solidify it. First things first, plug your financial leaks, the four areas to plug financial leaks. IRS, a lot of people tip the government. Number two, interest. A lot of people haven't renegotiated their interest rates or they haven't restructured their loans or even reallocated their funds. I know people that have underperforming investments and yet they have high interest rate loans that if they cash out that investment and pay off a high interest rate loan, it improves cash flow. The third thing to keeping more of what you make, plugging financial leaks, is investments. There's a lot of hidden fees and you have to become a financial detective to discover those fees and remove them so the less drag on your investments, you end up with more money in the future. And the fourth I is insurance. Insurance, a lot of people have duplicate coverages or improper structure, and they're paying the highest cost of insurance for the first dollars that they buy because they're insuring inconsequential things instead of just the catastrophic. So the IRS, interest, investments, and insurance help you keep more of what you make without cutting back. So this isn't budgeting, this is efficiency. The second step is to engineer wealth. What is your monthly expenses? Let's reverse engineer and see what kind of cash flow your assets have to produce to cover that. Is it Acquiring new assets to create that cash flow? Is it paying off loans? It depends on who you are and what your investment opportunities are. Then the third step, and this is critically important because almost no financial firms teach this, is you've got to create cash flow instead of accumulate. Accumulation is a slow, dangerous, dogmatic process where people lock their money up in retirement plans and neglect cash flow. When they wait for 30 years hoping compound interest will save them, it's risky. Instead, I want you to focus on taking your lazy assets, those ones not producing cash flow, and create cash flow with them to get economic independence, and here's why. When, you, when most people are trained to do finance, it's earn money and take 10% of the money and invest it to get 10%. But in this kind of economy, stocks and bonds and the things that are out of our control that we hand to Wall Street are very unpredictable and unlikely to create a 10% return. So saving 10% of your money and watching it go down by 10% is infuriating. It's frustrating. And it can have people become mentally de you know, detrimental to the mindset because it invites scarcity. So instead of taking 10% and trying to earn 10%, I want you to create 100% of your expenses coming from assets so that 100% percent of your active income can build more assets. That's a 10 times advantage. So this is the key, accelerating investment income and becoming a cash flow investor. So first, plug your leaks. Second, engineer your wealth. Third, accelerate your investment income. And fourth, it's about investing back into yourself. Become a better investor by knowing your investor DNA. Invest in your business to grow the output of that because you're making more money by hiring the right people, by adding the right processes and technology and whatever tweaks help you to scale that revenue. Whether you're an entrepreneur working in an organization and looking for upside potential, or whether you're an entrepreneur because you own something. And as an investor, we're all entrepreneurs if we're looking for actively in engaging to create more recurring revenue. Now, the fifth one is to make life count. Rather than wait for one day someday and retire, enjoy life along the way. Build time for yourself. Be willing to invest into recreation, rejuvenation, you know, be able to have a hobby so that you're not exhausting yourself. If you exhaust yourself, you'll have less to give. And this is really where it's str a struggle because of what society's trained us on. Society tells us, work hard and you'll get results results. But hard work with the wrong philosophy decimates energy, destroys relationships because you don't have time for them, and you end up a lesser version of who you are. 
So it becomes uh, quantum and it becomes exponential when we find our investor DNA, when we discover what I call our sole purpose, which is our values, our abilities, and our passions combined for our highest vision or context of living. Sole purpose is who we are when we're at our best so that we can add the most value in the world. So if we plug financial leaks, it gives us more fuel to add to our cash flow. If you like the energy of the drop-in, where you actually got to see me in a conversation where I was interviewed, or I was actually at a venue where I was speaking to a group of people. There's a certain energy that comes from that. So if you'd like to see another segment where we pulled it from a speech right here in the comfort of wherever you're watching this from, well, click this next video now.